All right, so I just want to talk about the projects. So the first thing you have to do is get a machine ready for malware analysis, which you talked about last time. I just want to review it here. It's H2 and PMA31 are the two projects that you do. First, you need to make a Windows image. And I'm using 2016 server for no particularly good reason. We could just as well use Windows 10. But anyway, you can get an ISO from Microsoft for 180 day evaluation. And then you just run your virtualization product which creates simulated hardware and you go through the normal Microsoft installation and make sure to choose the version with desktop experience. I made that mistake earlier today. Otherwise you get no graphical environment and that's not good enough to run the tools we want to run. Um, and then install this thing. And once you've done it, you've got a plain windows machine and the things we want to change are um, turning off automatic updates, allowing downloads through the browser, Turn, like turning off enhanced security configuration. And then I just turned off all the um, these protections and also made a um, configured a uh, ex exception anyway. Um, and then here I turned off the firewall and lowered DEP settings, which I think is not that important for what we're doing here uh, anyway. And also you need to put on VMware tools. That's real important. If you don't do that, you won't be able to copy and paste into your virtual machine or adjust the size of the desktop or other handy things. So that gets you a basic Windows Server 2016 machine running. And for this class, we have to have um, turn off the updates, which is already from before, make sure you can download things and then make an exception so you can have a folder that is not scanned by the antivirus and then um, put on Firefox and 7-Zip and the malware, the Practical Malware Analysis Labs. If you have not succeeded in turning off the antivirus, it will refuse to let you have this malware. You'll be able to download the 7-Zip file, but when you unzip it, it will just throw away all the unzipped stuff, which it recognizes as being malware. So that's the game. And so now let me show you my machine I've got set up here. Um, in fact, what I'm gonna do is just share this whole desktop over here so I can show you the instructions and the screen at the same time. So that is this one. All right. Good. That looks right. So here, uh, let me put the instructions over here and shrink them down. All right. And get rid of those. All right. So here's my machine. And what I've done here. This is a Windows Server 2016 machine. And as you see, I've got 180 days because I just made this machine fresh today. And um, I made a mal. Now I used, I installed the VMware tools and then I turned on sharing so I can share my downloads folder from my host Mac into the virtual machine, which is a real handy way to get software into there. Anyway, then I've got Firefox and in here I've got my malware. So you download the malware and unzip it and you'll have these labs, binary collection, and a whole series of malicious files for every chapter. So we'll play with a few of these. And so the project I wanna show you is 101C and 102, uh, 102C. Um, we're not gonna do the dynamics tonight, but the static. These are the first ones. So you get your malware. Now you could upload them to Virus Total and see an automated analysis up there, which is fine, but I'm not gonna go through that. That's, they also have a sandbox now. You can get some sandbox information up there, which is pretty cool. But I'm more interested in this class in, in learning how to do it ourselves. So let's start with PE view. You have to download and install the tool, although there isn't any real installation and it doesn't go in the programs menu. What I did was just download it and I put it in the documents folder. So you get this thing called PE view and all you do is unzip it. And when you unzip it, it's just right there. And that's true of all four of these tools. These are very simple tools. They don't have a normal installer or go to the program menu. They're just a one executable that just goes in a folder. So I put shortcuts here to them. They're all just like that. You just unzip them and run them. So PE view is here and PE view lets you look in a file. So if I look at the chapter one file, labo101.exe, this will show me the file. And if you, just look here, you'll see the raw contents of an executable file. This is in hexadecimal. This is the first 16 bytes, the next 16 bytes. Here's the raw hexadecimal bytes. 
Here's the ASCII for what's printable. And every Windows executable starts with MZ. And it always has this program cannot be running DOS mode down here. Notice this is ASCII text, where it's one byte per letter. And this stuff looks like Unicode, R-I-C-H-M, with these extra bytes in between, although not everywhere. Anyway, here's the PE for the portable executable header. Here's the text, the sections, the text, R data, and data sections in the header. And if you then there's a lot of zeros. And if you go down here, here's some more stuff. Here are um, Windows API calls. You get to recognize these. Close handle, notice the capital letters and the words just run together. These are Microsoft Windows functions in a standard format. Map view of file, create file, create file A, find next file A, find first file A. Um, yes, that's the. I think this is the import address table. But anyway, we, uh, we can find out for sure. So now you go down here. You'll see some more good stuff. Here's a list of dills that are imported. I, and here, by the way, these are not import dills. These are strings used by the program. Notice this one, warning this will destroy your machine. That's obviously a message written by the developer. And by the way, you can see here kernel 32. And up here, you see kerny 132dil So that is a fake malicious name intended to look like kernel 32, but be spelled wrong, that's probably a very valuable indicator of compromise right there. That looks like some kind of file or process that's going to be created by the malware with a deceptive name and probably a useful thing to know. And so this is just looking at the raw contents. And now you can break it up here. Here's the DOS header, which tells you what um, which is pretty much um, and the stub program that says it cannot be run in DOS mode. Those things are pretty much boilerplate, always the same. Here's the image NT headers. And so you've got, again, pretty much boilerplate stuff here to say it's a portable executable file. Uh, and then you've got the image file header. And this has a time date stamp, which we mentioned before. This is useful to uh, detect if two files are related because they were compiled at the same time and to get some clue about what part of the world the malware is from if you assume that they're working in normal business hours. And here's the optional header. And down here is the export table and the import table. These are the addresses that point to the export table and the import table, which we'll see a lot more of later. Um, but here they are, here's the import table. So here's the list of all the API calls that it calls from libraries. You see that at the end, it tells you which library. So kernel 32 library, it uses these functions, close handle and unmap view of file and so on. And then it has only one more dill it uses, which is msvcrt.dill. And from there, it gets these other functions that look much lower level with the underscore in front of them. Um, these are lower level functions, not intended to be as commonly used with these friendly names, but more like internal system functions. And uh, all right, uh, and then you've got, uh, anyway, here's the text section header. These just tell you the size of sections and so on, and we'll see a lot more for them later. This is the text section. This stuff is assembly code, which we're going to go into quite a bit later. Uh, that's why you can't read it. It's called the text section, but what's actually included is assembly language instructions. Little groups of one to five bytes here, typically, are assembly language instructions. Um, here's the R data, and some of that is readable. Anyway, so that's this tool gives you an overview of the file, and we'll use quite a few other tools that do similar things. And uh, can you edit here? Oh. Um, you might be able to, I haven't tried that. You can edit it with hex editors. I don't know if PE view will let you do it, but you can totally edit it with HXD. Anyway, so that's um, PE view. Then there's PE ID, which is here. And you just hit these three dots to open a file. So if I open the same one, labo101.exe, this tells you, here it tells you what language the file is written in, Microsoft Visual C++ 6. Now, it cannot always determine what language it's written in, but if it obeys normal conventions, which means it was made with a normal development environment, compiling things according to usual standards, it'll be right there. And it has um, sections here, and you can see the various sections, text, R data, and data with information about their size. 
and a few other things. So this is just showing you the same kind of information as the previous tool in a different layout, but the part it makes it easy to spot is what language it was written in. And then um, bin text. This is my favorite tool. Very nice. This tool reads through any file and just lets you see all the strings in that file. So you choose a file and go, and you just see all the sequences of characters that spell out a readable thing in either ASCII or Unicode, Microsoft Unicode that is. So here is this program cannot be run in DOS mode. And here's the name of sections like text and R data. Here's those API calls again, close handle, unmap view of file and all that. The name is of libraries. Here's those low level function calls starting with underscores. Here's the um, kerny 132.dil. Uh, here's the warning, this will destroy your machine. So, you know, a lot of good things in there and it's real easy. You don't have to do anything complicated. You'll see domain names in here, IP addresses, a lot of good stuff. But of course, seeing it in strings doesn't really prove anything about the functionality of the file. For example, if I see find first file A, it makes me think it's probably calling the Windows API call find first file A, but that could just be a string that's in a message. I don't really know how it's used. But, you know, most of the time, the strings are not overly deceptive. And if you can read them, it's very easy to guess what's going on here. So there's a few challenges to analyze a couple of files here and find some flags. And then um, there's dependency walker. So dependency walker is actually a productive tool used by real code authors. And therefore, it's a little less um, friendly. The point of dependency walker is to notice if this file is missing some libraries and it found that something's missing. I'm just going to ignore that because I'm not really trying to debug this malware. And I've got a link here where you can read about why this happens, but I don't really care about that. I just want to see what it does. And so what dependency walker shows you is all the libraries that are called here. And I can shrink this down to see them all there. Really only two dills, but they then call other dills. And I can now view things. So if I look at msvcrt.dil, here it will show me just what functions are called. And we saw this in other forms in the other tools, but it's here too in, and these are the imports, which are the functions it imports from libraries. So in it gets the msvcrt library and it tries to find these functions in there, p commode and fpf mode and these other functions. And if it goes to kernel 32, it finds these things, close handle, copy file A, create file A. And, and these are the exported labels in the files. So these are not actually functions exported for something else to use like they would be from a library. There's something like handles anyway. I'm not quite sure what they are. But anyway, um, there you get to see the functions it uses. And see, if you see this here, this shows that in fact, that create file A was not just a random string. It really did import that from this library. And the primary function of this, of course, is if you were writing this program and it had a problem, then you can figure out which library call was not working. Uh, let's see, worried about destroying my humble machine. Yeah, that's why you work in a, um, in a virtual machine for all this stuff. None of this malware is too destructive, but you don't want to put it on your normal machine. How does the program copy itself to System32 when it requires privilege to do that? Um, it's a good question. And I think this malware has to be run as administrator to do that. We'll see, uh, we might see later. I'm not sure if we're gonna do that exactly here. Um, this, remember this malware is pretty old. It dates all the way back to Windows XP before there was user account control. So I think this malware assumes it's running on Windows XP as administrator. Um, and of course, that's why they added it. So uh, those are very good questions. Anyway, uh, so there's that. And um, let's see. There's a few more flags to find. And there's just one other thing I want to show you, which is a packed file, which is this one. So here, if you look at labo102.exe in say bin text, let's open bin text, the easiest tool, and then open labo102.exe down here and run this one. And you'll see a very short list of strings, uh, just a few, API calls to things like get process address, virtual allocate, virtual free, a couple of libraries, 
Not much at all here. And there's a reason for that. If you look at that thing in PEID um, here, uh, lab 0102, notice it doesn't tell you what language it's written in, nothing found. So this does not seem to be written by a normal development tool like Visual Studio. And if you look at the section, it's UPX1. And if you look at all the sections, they're named UPX0, UPX1, and UPX2. Instead of having normal names like .text, .data, and .rdata, this is the well-known UPX universal packing tool. And the purpose of this tool is to hide malware from observation and to make it smaller. So what happens is it zips the sections, stores them on the disk, and it has a little loader which unzips them and puts them in RAM. So you can unpack it with the UPX tool. And that's what you'll see here. You can download UPX. It's a uh, open source unpacker. And you can use the command line and you can unpack it by just uh, getting to the right directory and unpack it. And then you'll see what I had here. Uh, if I go to uh, users and administrator and desktop and malware, all right, and uh, dir. I'll see practical malware analysis. So I go to there, practical malware analysis, and CD chapter. All right, let's, oh, CD, I think it's binary. Yeah. And uh, let me see if I can fit that on the screen a little better. All right. And now I CD into um, lab. All right, let's just do a dirt to see what I got. Oh, it's chapters. Okay, CD chapter. Okay. And. Uh, after 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, one. There we are, one. Now if I do a dir, all right. So you can see I've unpacked it. The original Lab02 was three kilobytes. When I unpacked it with UPS, it turned into 16 kilobytes. So that's the, uh, that's the point. Packing it made it smaller. And the unpacked file, now I can look at the strings there and I'll see something very different. So if I go to bin text and browse and open the unpacked file, now I have a different list. Now it has the program cannot be run in DOS mode. Now it calls things about time, wait for single object, create mutex, a totally different bunch of strings. And I've even got a URL now, like a command and control service and an Internet Explorer version and so on. So that's the cool thing about uh, unpacking things, of course. Now I can really see the strings in it. All right. And so that should be enough to get you started on the first couple labs. Those labs cover the techniques we talked about last time. The techniques we talked about this time are in the next project's basic dynamic analysis here, where you'll practice using the tools we talked about today. So you should start doing these labs and uh, you should all be able to get into Canvas now and turn them in. Um, all right. So I think that's it. Let's see, how do we unpack without using UPS? We don't know which program is used to pack, ha ha. A very good question. We are going to get there. If you want to use a, if you want to unpack something manually, we're going to do that down here in the extra credit. Let me, there we are. Down here, you can do it. You do it with an un, with Ollie Debug and PE Studio. You run it and put it in RAM, and then you take the RAM file and put it back on the disk, and then you have to rebuild the import table. It's not exactly fun, but you can do it. And we are going to do it here in the extra credit projects. But that is how you do it. A very good question. All right. So I'm going to stop the recording and put these videos up.